is, uh, uh, it is wonderful to be here. Uh, as Kate mentioned, I, I'm a graduate, a proud graduate of Pearson. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what my year was, um, but I will give you a little glimpse of your future. When I was sitting up there just now, I texted my best friend from Pearson. I said, Becky, you're never going to believe it. I'm in the Max Bell, surrounded by people saying they're year, year 42 and 43. How did we ever get so old? <laughs> In fact, you're all so young and beautiful and intelligent, I have a really hard time believing that I was ever one of you. But I do remember quite clearly, and I was thinking about this driving in today, I was sitting right down there somewhere. It was an event like this, and the speaker on stage was a woman uh, telling me, telling us about what it was like to live with HIV, to be HIV positive. And it was the first time I had ever knowingly been in a room with someone who admitted that they were HIV positive. It happened here, just right down there. And you know, since then I've gone to university, I've become an adult, theoretically, um, and I have an organ and child to prove it. What I have done though is I've tried to dedicate my working life to HIV and to contributing to the effort, the global effort, to end HIV, to make it, uh, to eliminate it, to exterminate it, to mean that none of our children will ever have to worry about it, live with it. So the idea that I want to get across to you today is quite simple. It's really the product of my life these last 25 years. Ending AIDS is a possibility. We have all of the tools in our hands right now to be able to eliminate it as a significant, substantial public health concern, possibly as early, by as early as 2030. In fact, ending AIDS is not a medical challenge any longer. It is a political, social, and a cultural issue. And that is what I want to try and get across to you today. Of course, it doesn't work. There we go. First of all, let's start with the basics. What are the numbers? HIV, by any uh, stretch, is one of the most important global issues facing the world today. 36 million people around the world are living with the virus, which causes AIDS, uh, and in 100% of cases, leads to death. Last year, 1.1 million people died of AIDS, and 2.1 million people were newly infected. So this is a problem that is growing, not receding. It is unfortunately not a disease of rich white people in northern climates like me, but rather it is increasingly a disease of the people in the south, people who are brown, black, and yellow, and increasingly of women. As this shows, there are unfortunately some countries, especially in sub-Saharan sub Africa, where approximately 15% of the adult population are living with HIV. Here in Canada, we have a much smaller epidemic about one-tenth of one percent of all Canadians are living with the virus. However, similar to the global pattern, it is disproportionately affecting people who are already vulnerable, who are already marginalized. Like this man, an indigenous person who uses drugs in Vancouver's downtown east side, which is also the neighborhood I live and work in. In my community, 25% of individuals, especially women who are working in sex work, uh, men, who are, men and women who are using injection drugs, Approximately 25% of them are living with HIV. What is HIV? Well, it's a virus. It's those little green specks that you can see on this electron micrograph. And like every virus, virus it needs a host to reproduce and to spread. HIV chooses the cells of the human immune system, uh, and over time it colonizes that system, leading to uh, immune dysfunction and to death. Fortunately for us as a species, it's very hard to get HIV. Casual contact, touching, kissing, sharing uh, knives and spoons, etc. None of that spreads HIV. What is needed is transfusions of blood between individuals, often the kind that happens during sexual contacts, vertically, although that is increasingly uh, not an issue in Canada, by which I mean the transmission between a mother and her uh, daughter, uh, her child during, during childbirth, or as I mentioned earlier, the sharing of used injecting equipment. We have no cure, we have no vaccine. And so in 100% of untreated cases, uh, within approximately 10 years, an individual's immune system will cease to function and they could die as, sim as something as simple as the common cold. Fortunately, what we do have and what we've developed over the last 20 years is treatment for the virus. Uh, this is an individual who's taking a, a pill, a once a day pill for HIV which uh, uh, manages to interrupt with how the virus operates, 
it, uh, and it leaves uh, uh, no trace of the virus left in the individual's bloodstream. It's not a cure, they still have HIV. However, the important part is that it puts the disease into remission. My boss, who is a physician who has been treating HIV patients since the early days in the 1980s, he liked to tell the story of how originally when people would come to him, newly diagnosed with HIV, he would typically tell them that they would have days or weeks or months to live. Now, with the new treatments, he promises new people newly diagnosed with HIV that they will dance at the weddings of their children. And in fact, the life expectancy for someone living with HIV who is well treated with modern medicine exceeds that of HIV negative individuals. Now, of course, there are some other considerations. These pills are expensive. Typically, you know, it depends on what kind of pills you have, this might be as much as $20,000 per month. And of course, this is for the rest of an individual's life. Like any pills, they have side effects. And they're really the requirement of what we call lifetime adherence. At least one pill a day for the rest of your life. Because of this, medical practice has been to tell people to wait. To wait until they get sick, and only then you begin taking the pills, which will make them healthy and prolong their life. But by any measure, the development of these pills has been a remarkable success. This shows the death rate from HIV in the United States uh, between uh, 19th, that was a bad idea. Well, that was a really bad idea. Uh, I hit something that's made it uh, stop working. Oh, there we go. Never trust me with technology. So this red uh, line shows the death rate uh, from HIV uh, in the United States between 1987 uh, and the late 1990s. And just like Al Gore's famous line, you'll see that in the early part of the 1980s and 1990s, the number of people dying from HIV went up and up and up, till at the peak of that line, it was the leading cause of death for adults in the United States. The top of the line indicates where new treatment was uh, where, where treatment was first introduced. And you can see that very quickly people got on treatment and quite simply they stopped dying. This has been replicated around the world and there have been millions of lives saved by the provision of these, technology, of these medications. What we also learned was that it not only kept people alive, it prevented it passing along the infection to anyone else. We learned it through pregnant women. Back in the early 90s, there, were, uh, there was no treatment, and so in childbirth, women would often pass the infection along uh, to, their, to their offspring during childbirth. However, after they were put on medication, those cases became much less common. And in fact, there's not been a child born in Canada since 2004. So some smart scientists, much smarter than I am in South Africa, got to thinking, well, what if we treated everyone with HIV? What if we found everyone in the population who was living with HIV, put them on treatment so that that would keep them alive and it would prevent them from passing along the virus to anyone else? They made a very uh, complicated computer simulation and the result was the green line. The computer said that after 20 years, there would simply be no more new cases of HIV in the population. So doctors, we don't do anything without uh, what's called a clinical trial. This was a clinical trial that was published in 2011. And what it really showed was that this idea that we should put people on treatment to keep them alive and to keep them from passing along their virus, and we could show that it works. Quite simply, there was, among the people who were given the early treatment, there was a 96% decline in the number of new infections compared to the people who waited. That's led to a new United Nations program. It's called the 9099. And these, uh, this is the official global United Nations response to how we should deal with the HIV AIDS pandemic. And quite simply, it says that for us to eliminate um, the virus, we have to find among the people who are HIV positive, we have to make sure that 90% of them know that they're living with the virus. And of those, we have to get 90% on treatment, and of those, we have to have 90% successfully treated. According to the mathematical simulations, should we do that, we will eliminate HIV by 2030. I'm very proud to say in BC we've already shown that it is possible to do this. Since 2010, the government has invested in a program called Treatment and Prevention that's tried to uh, encourage testing and ensure that everyone who is HIV positive in British Columbia starts on treatment immediately. What's been the result? Well, the blue line shows that more and more people in HIV in British Columbia are on treatment. And as the blue line went up, the 
The red line showing the number of new cases has gone down. This is a terribly, look, this is a terribly ugly slide. But what it does show is that here in BC, we're the only province to see a reduction in the number of new cases. BC is also the only province so far to invest in this kind of strategy to end the pandemic. So, what does this mean? Quite simply, if you're an individual living with HIV, if you get on medication, your disease will be in remission and you will not pass it along. For a community, the more people that we can get onto treatment, that we can get into health, in life-saving health care, the more will be, um, uh, the less will die, the less number of new cases will be, will be uh, uh, transmitted. But the sad reality today is around the world, less than 30% of the people currently living with HIV have access and are on this life-saving treatment. And this is the reason why the HIV pandemic continues to sp spread and continues to grow. So what are the real barriers? Why aren't we doing better? Why are there 70% of people out there who are living with HIV who don't have the medications they need to stay alive? Well, you're probably going to say cost. And it's certainly true that delivering medications to these folks is expensive. In BC, we spend $80 million every year on pills alone. However, this short-term cost results in medium and long-term savings. Because every person who doesn't get sick, who doesn't die, who stays in the workforce, who does not give, uh, pass along the virus along to his family or to his friends, is a net positive <coughs> for the provincial economy. But it remains that cost and access to health care uh, is a challenge. We've heard today about a woman, Susan, who didn't live within 100 kilometers of a clinic, took two days to carry her there. Similarly, for many people living with HIV, they simply do not have access to the health care that they need to keep them alive. But another problem is stigma and discrimination. We've heard as well today about the cost, the terrible toll of stigma and discrimination for people who are living with mental health concerns. It is similar to people living with HIV. For many of them, they do not want anyone to know that they are HIV positive, not, only, not even their family members, not even their doctors. I remember I interviewed one man who was HIV positive, and I said, well, when you go to jail, why do you stop taking your pills? He said, well, it's very simple. Because if I take my pills in jail, someone might find out I'm HIV positive, and they'll beat me up. I know I've done it. So those are the sorts of reasons why people conceal their, their status. They do not seek the health care that they need. And the issue that I'm really interested in is the one of addiction. So many people who are living with HIV are also living with addiction. They are drug users, they are addicted to heroin, they are addicted to cocaine. And unfortunately, as a society, what we do is we criminalize them. People who are addicted to heroin and cocaine are much more likely to go to jail than to receive the sort of health care that they need, like addiction treatment and like HIV treatment. So that is the idea that I want to spend, uh, uh, leave with you today, is that the barriers to ending HIV are not, no longer clinical, they're no longer medical, Instead, what they are are political and social. And if we are able to, to fight against these barriers and to dismantle these barriers, hopefully, 25 years from now, there will be none of us sitting here and there will be no speakers talking about the burden of HIV in their communities. Thank you.